time is now 6.03 and I will call to order this hybrid public meeting. It is February 7th, 2024. My name is Julie Bond and I'm the chair of the Historic Preservation Commission. Regular meetings and public hearings of the Clark County Historic Preservation Commission are held in a hybrid format with both in-person and virtual participation options for commissioners, staff, and the public. This will allow for safe participation by commission members, staff, and any citizen interested in attending. For those of you joining remotely via computer, you should be able to see tonight's meeting agenda on your screen. If you can't see the screen and have joined by phone only, I will be announcing the agenda items as we move through the meeting topics. Members of the public and applicants that have joined remotely are attendees. Other event participants cannot hear your audio unless you are acknowledged by the commission chair or staff and are unmuted. This evening's agenda is planned as follows. Roll call and introductions, prior meeting notes approval, public comment for subjects other than the public hearing on this meeting's agenda, as there will be specific public comment periods as part of hearings, a presentation from the Interstate Bridge Replacement Cultural Resource Program staff regarding mitigation, HPC rules and procedures, intro and bylaws work session, commission announcements and events, subcommittee updates and announcements, good of the order and adjournment. We will now have a roll call of HPC members who are present for this meeting. Commission members, please say I'm here after I call your name. Dan Bader. Here. Morgan Frazier. Here. Andy Gregg is excused. Heidi Mandler Huck is excused. Jane Thatcher. Here. John um, Zingali. John Zingali. Hey, Julie, it's really hard to hear you. So I don't, I don't know if you need to move your mic closer. John Zingali. I know that he is on the call. Perhaps he's stepped away. And I am here, Julie Vaughn. item on the agenda is our meeting notes approval. Does anyone have any comments on the draft January 3rd meeting notes? I have I have one comment. Um, I was reading over the um, minutes and um, it, when I was reading over the minutes and uh, it was talking about members present and then members absent and then it was saying who was remote and then it has a, a box for guests. But we didn't have any guests in the room. So maybe we, we could put when Holly is here virtually, that she's here virtually, so that we can distinguish between when she's here in person. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, hearing none, I will take a motion for approval of the January 3rd meeting notes. I will make a motion to accept the January meeting notes uh, with the amendment. I will second this motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion passes. We will now take public comment on any items outside of public hearing items. We will, we will begin with attendees in the room and there are none. We will now take public comment from online attendees. Susan, can you please read the instructions? If you are using a computer or the WebEx application on a tablet or smartphone, if you would like to make a comment, please raise your virtual hand. There are instructions on the screen on how to do this. Typically, the hand icon is located towards the bottom of your screen, but you may need to click on the icon that looks like a circle with three dots in order to raise see the raise hand option. For anyone on the telephone audio only option, please dial star three on your phone's number panel to raise your hand. Staff will be able to see hands once they are raised and will, will request to unmute you one at a time. And Holly has her hand raised. Holly, you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you. And good evening, commissioners, staff, and guests. This is Holly Chamberlain from the Historic Trust. 
uh, with some updates for you this evening. Occupancy continues to be high at Providence Academy with the recent average at about 90%. Four unit turnovers are in progress and those spaces will be on the market soon. New chairs are being purchased for Providence Hall. The old chairs will be donated to Habitat for Humanity. An analysis of event rentals at the Academy has shown that weddings provide about 95% of the revenue. Word of mouth publicity and positive online reviews have had a strong influence. The annual fire system and a monitor alarm monitoring inspections have been completed. The trust donated several historic photographs to Providence archives this past January. As their staff time allows, they will be made available to the general public online. Recent ice, snow, and wind brought down one tree and many branches at the historic reserve, but did relatively little damage overall. The preservation crew did an excellent job of snow and ice removal for the tenants. Storm cleanup has been completed. Open houses for available units have been proving successful in attracting new tenants to Officers Row and Environs, and commercial and residential occupancy is averaging around 90%. The open houses provide potential tenants with historical information as well as leasing specifics. Two turnovers are in progress and those units will be available for rental soon. The trust presented guiding principles for IBR mitigation to the cultural resources stakeholder group and consultants. In partnership with the NAACP Vancouver branch, the trust is presenting a humanities washing program by Luther Adams, free man of color, entitled A Space for Black History, tomorrow on February 8th. This free program begins at 6 p.m. at the Red Cross Building, 605 Barn Street, Vancouver. Nominations for the 2024 General George C. Marshall Leadership Awards are due no later than this Friday, February 9th. The annual awards are presented to a local community leader under age 35 and to a high school senior. Nomination forms can be found at www.thehistorictrust.org. The first presentation of the 2024 Vancouver Barracks Military Association Lecture Series is George Washington and His Legacy. The program is set for Thursday, February 22nd. Uh, George Washington's 292nd birthday at 6.30 p.m. at the Howard House, 750 Anderson Street. The speaker is retired local history teacher, author, and Marine Corps Reserve Combat Veteran Jeff Dacus. Dacus's new book on Washington, Perceptions of Battle, is due out in May. Trust President and CEO Temple Lenz has joined the board of the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation and is serving on the Public Policy Committee. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Are there any other public comments online? I do not see any other raised hands. Okay. This concludes the general public comment portion of this meeting. We will now move to new business. The first item is a presentation on mitigation from the Interstate Bridge Replacement Cultural Resource Program. Haley Ref is the program manager for this project and will lead the discussion. Is she on line? Okay. I'm here. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent, thank you. And perfect to manage the slides. Great, so thanks so much uh, for having the IBR program back. As we discussed last time when we came to provide a presentation to you, we wanted to follow up with a little bit more detail about effects to the cultural resources that have been identified within the area of potential effect. Um, and to talk to you a little bit about mitigation, uh, which is an ongoing conversation as part of our overall uh, programmatic agreement process um, within the planning stages of the program. So with that slide, please. This evening, we will talk about um, the summary of previously recorded archaeological sites within the area of potential effect, or the APE, a summary of potential adverse effects to historic built environment resources, introduction to mitigation and understanding what it is and what the context is, um, some examples of potential mitigation, and then some next steps. Slide, please. So 
So uh, there are the, the area of potential effect of the APE contains 15 previously recorded archaeological sites, all of which are located on the Washington portion of the um, program area. 14 of those are listed, or I'm sorry, are eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places, and one is unevaluated. Um, it should be noted that archaeological investigations are not complete. Our Section 106 programmatic agreement will establish a protocol for phased identification. And here on the right, you're seeing our APE map for that area of potential effect. Slide, please. Same map again. <laughs> 12 of the 15 previously recorded archaeological sites in the APE are located within the modified locally preferred alternative. These sites have the potential to be impacted by construction related physical ground disturbance during the program construction. Slide please. So here's a detailed breakdown of the preliminary eligibility evaluation of archaeological sites in the APE with the potential for adverse effects. So again, here, all of these are on the Washington side um, and have a little bit of detail about what we know. Again, archaeological analysis is ongoing and will um, be included in that programmatic agreement. Excellent, thank you, slide please, yeah. So moving on to the built environment, um, here's a summary of potential adverse effects to historic built environment resources. So the modified locally preferred alternative would result in adverse effects to 13 historic built environment resources, including seven properties in Washington, four properties in Oregon, and two interstate properties. Slide, please. Next, you'll see a breakdown, yeah, a, table, a detailed table of each of those resources. Um, so again, as noted, some in Oregon and Washington in this case, and then some that are interstate, and that's the bridges themselves, the north and southbound respectively. Um, in Washington, we have the bridge substation, the Normandy apartments, and then the larger Vancouver National Historic Site and Historic Reserve District um, kind of unit as a singular, but then broken down by resource there. It should also be noted that all of these summaries um, of the findings of these impacts to these resources are located within our findings of effects. Um, and we've just released our final ones to the consulting parties, um, either should be available either today or tomorrow. Alrighty, and slide please. So moving into an introduction to Section 106 mitigation, um, we wanted to sort of set the stage for where the conversation goes next and kind of what the mitigation is and how we talk about that and think about what those um, mitigation elements should be as we proceed with development of our programmatic agreement. And a big role that you all play as a consulting party is providing input as to what sort of mitigation uh, might be appropriate for these adverse effects. So um, as is noted here on the slide, it's the policy of the administration that measures necessary to mitigate adverse impacts be incorporated into the action. Measures necessary to mitigate adverse impacts are eligible for federal funding when the administration determines that, firstly, the impacts for which the mitigation is proposed actually result from the administration action, and two, the proposed mitigation represents a reasonable public expenditure after considering the impacts of the action and the benefits of the proposed mitigation measures. In making this determination, the administration will consider, among other factors, the extent to which the proposed measures would assist in complying with a federal statute, executive order, or administration regulation or policy. So to break that down a little bit further, slide please. Some considerations as we uh, start talking about mitigation broadly is that mitigation is a way to remedy, offset, or compensate for an adverse effect. The regulations do not prescribe specific mitigation measures. Rather, they allow the federal agency and the consulting parties, you, to negotiate appropriate measures on a case-by-case -case basis. In order to be appropriate, the negotiated and agreed to mitigation measures should bear a responsible relationship, I'm sorry, a reasonable relationship to the undertaking's adverse effects, or more generally, the types of adverse effects or type of historic properties at issue. So that's from the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, or often referred to as the ACHP. And then from Federal Highway, 
federal highways policy regarding mitigation that utilizes public funding, including alternative mitigation, is that it, quote, represents a reasonable public expenditure after considering the impacts of the action and the benefits of the proposed mitigation measures, end quote. Slide, please. So to summarize all of that together, the key issues in determining appropriate resolution of adverse effects for the Interstate Bridge Program include what is in the public interest, what are the benefits to or concerns of the Section 106 consulting parties, those they represent, and those who ascribe importance and value to the property. If the proposed mitigation is designed to advance our knowledge about the past, how will this knowledge be provided to the public, to schools, to tribes or NHOs, and to professionals? Will the proposed mitigation enhance the preservation and management of listed or eligible historic properties in the region? And is the proposed mitigation commensurate with effects to the property? So those are kind of the questions that we're looking to ask as we talk about mitigation measures that we propose for the impacts to the cultural resources that have been identified. So slide please, moving forward talking about some potential mitigation and some examples that we've seen um, in other projects that have been successful. So none of these are specific to the effects or the resources necessarily that have been identified here, but step through some options to kind of help give you a sense of other mitigation actions that have been utilized in other situations in case it is helpful for making suggestions um, here within the IBR program area. So we'll step through a range of activities such as program design considerations, data recovery, historic resource rehabilitation, relocation, reuse, and salvage, historic built environment documentation, public education and interpretation, and archaeology and historic preservation field schools. Again, no mitigation has yet been decided and we're in the discussion phase, so these are just general ideas for inspiration. Slide, please. I will move through these slides relatively quickly, though I recognize there is a lot of content. Um, these slides are intended for you to digest at your own pace and not on your own time. And um, I know that you'll have access to this material. So certainly stop me if you have a question, but otherwise we'll move pretty quickly through the material so that you can digest it on your own time. Um, so some examples here broadly of historic built environment documentation that range a variety of technology from um, full format photography, which is very low tech, to full laser scanning, high definition laser scanning on the high end. Slide, please. <clears throat> so examples we've seen of public education and interpretation. Um, we've seen welcome centers for, if, for example, this one in particular is the Alaskan Way Viaduct Replacement Program. Um, in that case, WASHDOT funded a temporary public information center in Seattle's P Pioneer Square neighborhood. Um, there's online pamphlets and software such as ArcGIS and StoryMaps, HistoryLink.org essays. Um, there are options for oral history interviews, um, different various um, museum exhibitions and displays, curriculum plans, public lecture series, etc. Lots of options in that arena. Slide, please. We've also seen some program design considerations that have been successful in reflecting cultural significance. So this is a specific example in Glenwood, Iowa, uh, that worked with several local indigenous artists um, and included a lot of art and then um, landscape understanding for the visitor. So this is a really comprehensive um, and really, I think, advanced design that has been done at this rest area that I recommend checking out a little bit further. Slide, please. Um, there's also options like planting plans that incorporate species of traditional significance. Uh, so here you're looking at um, the planning palette for the Foster Island undercrossing at the SR520 bridge replacement project in Seattle, um, and it features native species of traditional importance to indigenous peoples. Slide, please. Additional design considerations could include visual screening through landscaping uh, that could be used to be uh, screen views for historic resources um, and other related areas. Slide, please. There are also options for noise attenuation and vibration management. 
there are some resources where we will be doing vibration management that we already know about um, and certainly would love to discuss further if there are additional concerns um, and we'll have opportunities to lay that out as well in our programmatic agreement as we proceed. All of this will go into that to be clear. Great, and slide please. Data recovery, um, as you're seeing here in images, is a mitigative effort to document a, a significant archaeological site so that important cultural information can be sufficiently recorded prior to impact by a project. Uh, so in this case, any recovered material would go to the respective state repositories in, wa in Washington and Oregon accordingly. Slide, please. Here we have historic resource rehabilitation, relocation, reuse, and salvage. Uh, so some information for other successful salvage um, <clears throat> and relocation and reuse elements here. Certainly a lot in that arena that could be discussed in this program area. Slide, please. And then um, as our final kind of mitigation idea slide here, we've got training programs and field schools. So um, coordinating with local field schools such as the Western, Western Washington University Archaeological Field School, the University of Washington's Field Methods in Indigenous Archaeology, and the University of Oregon Pacific Northwest Preservation Field School, as well as the Park Service Field School on site within Fort Vancouver are all um, local options for field schools and training programs, plus many more that we would love to hear from the community about. Okay, slide please. So next steps are to hear from consulting parties of whom you are one um, about any mitigation input for adverse effects in, in your case on the Washington side to above ground resources um, at this time, since we have not yet finalized our analysis of the archeological impacts. And then in time, as we develop our programmatic agreement, ongoing input as we do understand those effects for mitigation once those effects are identified. So an ongoing conversation, but really starting now with the known effects. Um, and, and the primary vehicle, as I've noted, is going to be the Section 106 programmatic agreement. So you will see the first formal draft of that document um, in early spring of 2024. And that will be uh, what will lay out our process for phase identification as noted previously. It will also note any mitigation for identified effects. And then it will also describe the process for how we will assess effects in that phase identification process amongst many other uses of the document. Um, so right now it is helpful for us to hear from you about mitigation ideas so that we can collate that and bring that into the document um, and agree upon that if, if um, we carry that forward and uh, make sure that our community input is robust as we develop that mitigation within our larger programmatic agreement process. So your input is greatly um, appreciated and any input that you'd like to share regarding mitigation for the resources that we know to date is, um, would be absolutely wonderful. So my last slide is next with our contact information. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Um, after the next slide with our contact information, our citations and additional information for all of the imagery, yeah, perfect, that we shared during that um, presentation so that you can take a look at those if you would like. Um, and certainly feel free to take a further look at any of the images or other project examples that we've shared tonight. So with that, thank you very much and I'll open it up for any questions that you may have. Hey, Lee. I'm going to look and to my colleagues see if they have any comments first. Um, I just have a question, Haley. I asked you this uh, last time you were here. How, I, you know, I saw the list of the properties and, and things like that, and uh, we're talking Section 106, and I understand that, but um, we are local, you know, CLG, you know, Historic Preservation Commission, and there are six listed properties, not including the big ones, in the APE, and there's also a historic overlay in the APE, and how does that relate to this process? The six resources or the, the overlay? Both. Yeah, so the six resources. Those, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. There's a little bit of a delay there, my apologies. Um, 
So with the overlay, it, well, really with the APE, what we're looking at, as you noted, through the Section 106 lens, are the resources directly located within the area of potential effect, right? Outside of that, then our identification level of effort is, is much, much lower to, or non-existent, depending on the type of resource that we're dealing with above or below ground. Um, and so, you know, the overlays extending outside of the APE are not really within our analysis purview because that's a much larger scenario, unless there's like an historic district or something like that, then we're not looking at that larger kind of conglomerate resource in the same lens that we would from, from a Section 106 perspective as those resources within the APE. Whereas the six resources within the APE um, are, you know, as I'm sure you are aware, assessed for their um, eligibility and then for the effects. And as we kind of included in the table, Earlier in the slide presentation, we do have some of adverse effects in um, in Washington, and that includes the uh, Normandy apartments, the bridge substation, and then uh, the related units kind of to the larger park, uh, National Park and Historic Reserve uh, vicinity. And so those are the ones where we're looking at understanding input for mitigation for those adverse effects um, and what might be appropriate. And so those that are kind of within the um, Clark County purview on the Washington side are, are very interested in your input on the mitigation for those, those affected resources. Hopefully that answered your question a little bit. Um, we can certainly- no, it, it, it didn't, it didn't, Haley. It didn't, it, this, is, this is the same question I asked last time. So as the Clark County Historic Preservation Commission, we have jurisdiction, jurisdiction over the overlay district and over those six properties that are not listed in your table because they're not listed at the federal level, but that's our purview. That's where we're looking at the effects of your project on our resources. Also, in, in addition to what you've identified for the federal project. So maybe does that make sense? It does. And maybe I think the key piece of information that I might be missing now is which six resources are you referring to that have that we have not evaluated, but that are within the APE. So have you looked at the um, Clark County Historic Register? Yes, we have. So within the APE, what we did first was our baseline analysis where we tallied up all identified resources within the APE that mm -hmm. are above ground. So anything that was built uh, before on or before 1982 is our year for research for buildings built. We looked at it uh, and we tabulated all of them in the baseline. And then those that were recommended eligible for listing in the National Register as part of the Section 106 identification process carried forward at the determination of eligibility phase, which was then shared with all of the consulting parties as well. Um, and then the effects were analyzed if, if those properties were both eligible and then would have an effect. And so all resources within the APE that were built after 1982 um, have been evaluated for this program. They, there's no, we did not not look at resources that are on the local register. Yeah, I, get, I, I, I understand that. And I, you probably looked at way more. We, um, <laughs> but we are only inter we're only interested in those six. Sure because they are listed on our register and um, so if there's going to be any adverse effects at all to them whether they're listed on the national register or even if you've determined them eligible or potentially eligible um, that is still um, an adverse effect for us and our local register Th does that make sense and so i'm just really concerned about those particular six properties and i, I am also um, interested in the mitigation around Providence Academy because that is the only overlay that is overlaps with your APE and that is our purview as um, commissioners. Sure yeah I appreciate that feedback so to be clear at the Academy the finding of effect is that there is a no adverse effect for that property that has been concurred with at the state level with the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation and so we're not discussing specific mitigation for the Academy site because there isn't an adverse effect to mitigate for and so that is again Archaeology is ongoing, and so we do anticipate that there could be some subterranean impacts to the property, um, but we don't have enough design to understand what that would look like yet. So that is the type of action that we would put into the programmatic agreement to be able to do that base identification 
um, after NEPA has closed out. And so that's a future investigation and a future analysis of effects and then a future mitigation conversation that would come for which the process would be established in the programmatic agreement. So that's why we're not asking for um, that. That's why the the academy property is not listed in the potential adverse effects because that is the adverse effect finding was a no adverse effect. Right. And I'm not necessarily talking about an adverse effect to the property. I'm talking about an adverse effect to the historic overlay. It's like a district. I think without an adverse effect to the property, then we're not able to assess an adverse effect to the larger resource because there isn't an adverse effect to, to the resource. Hmm. I guess I'll just have to keep asking more questions because According to Clark, and, and this, I know this is a federal project and everything gets a little, you know, mishy mashy. So I appreciate everything that you've done. I guess we're, we're a little confused is that if there's any effect at all to any of these resources, people are supposed to come to us and get a certificate of appropriateness before anything happens. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a little confused in the process how we are involved besides the mitigation for these properties that you listed that aren't the six that might have view shed changes or seismic issues, I don't know. Well, so let me do this then as our follow-up. Why don't we, mm -hmm. our team will go back and find all of the properties that are in the APE and that are under the purview through either an overlay or the local register. And then we'll make sure to share the documentation with you for the findings of effects for each of those properties so that you can step through the analysis of each of those resources and feel assured that the finding of no adverse effect is appropriate as part of that. That'd and that be wonderful. Good. That would be great. Oh my yeah, gosh, yeah. that'd be so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, we need that. Thank you. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, so we've shared all of the findings of effects, but I recognize that there are a lot of them. And, and so what we'll do is we'll pull out the ones that are specific to Clark County jurisdiction uh, and then bring, I'll send those over to uh, staff uh, through via BART so that you guys can get that distribution. Um, and then oh, that way- Thank you so much. Yeah, beeline to the resources that you're sort of, uh, that are under your purview. And then I think upon reading that and, and taking a look at those effects analysis, if you're feeling like there are some concerns, we're, we're in a comment period on the effects analysis, so please let us know and let's make sure to talk about Thank any you. that you might have there about effects and then we can kind of take that into the larger conversation as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I'm I'll leave it to other people who have probably have other questions. <laughs> no problem. But I'm, I'm glad you arrived at the destination there, so thanks so much for your help in, in getting there. Okay. It looks like in the room I may have some questions, but before... I ask, I'm gonna see if anyone on the phone has any questions. We have two commissioners on the phone who may wish to ask something. If so, if not, would you shake your head no? Okay. Um, I can't see John anymore. No, I do not. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, Sorry, so my, my question my, my connection um, hey, is a little unstable, so I'm off video at the moment, but I can still hear you. Okay, thank you. So my question, Haley, is you know, you're asking us for comment on mitigation. It's really hard to know it it's really hard to know until we know what the what's happening. Are the buildings being demolished? Are are is the um like are the view sheds simply being impacted? Like what it's hard to know what types of mitigation to even comment on or provide input to without knowing what is actually happening specifically. So, yeah, so I, I looked at that list of properties, but it still also seemed very, very high level. It really wasn't able to, I really wasn't able to kind of understand what's happening um, in order to provide feedback. Yeah, so in um, last November, October, November, we shared the full format of the findings of effects with all of the analysis for all of the properties that detail. I mean, each property has like, let's say no less than 15 pages of analysis um, for what the impact, the adverse or no adverse or no effect is. Um, and then we are submitting those again with modifications that have been made based on consulting party feedback over the last several months. 
and those actually should either go out, uh, they technically went to the state levels yesterday and today, and should be available for consulting parties tomorrow. Um, and so then we'll be accepting feedback on those findings of effects as well, it, the final, their final versions, um, but your feedback is, is still welcome. But those do break down uh, that table that you saw earlier with the high level analysis, as I noted, those are just a, a very brief summary of those much larger analysis documents that break down each property resource by resource, what the impact would be. Um, so we're just trying to kind of tabulate it for the discussion sake, but we do have a very deep pool of data that is supporting that very high level summary. Okay, I'm gonna ask Bart to scroll back to the earlier slides. Um, there's one section that I was just, I felt like it was very vague for me, and so it was hard for me to know quite what was happening. Yeah, just keep on going till, and, until it gives that chart of the various impacts. Yeah, the tables. There's two tables. Yeah, um, there's this one, one here. Yeah, that one. This one here. Yeah. So the one that I was most interested in understanding was the, the historic reserve. Um, there are, there's the hospital um, that, I have my office is actually potentially also impacted by this pro by this project, but I don't see it on here. And it is I guess by your criteria would be considered a historic building eligible. Um, there are, are things on our property that are on the national register. Uh, I don't see anything on here. Um, and then just north of us is the hospital right next to I five. And so just looking at this it would seem that none of that is going to be impacted. Um, but because it's all grouped together as a national reserve, it's hard for me to know, are those buildings going to be impacted? And if so, in what way? Yeah, so. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So Does that's that all. Matter? It sounds like, okay, as I say, it sounds like you have the information. I perhaps, maybe these meetings isn't where I'm going to find them. Maybe I need to do my own looking at your resources online, but um, I'm just going to well, so we've sent I know you're, yeah. information just uh, strictly at this point we've shared with consulting parties. So it's not necessarily available available on our public website. It's just distributions that we've sent directly to you all. So in January, we sent a distribution of a PowerPoint slide that broke down each property by property um, and the effects and the eligibility. And so the office, it, there may or may not be an eligible resource just because it was built after 1982 doesn't necessarily mean that it's eligible. Each one goes through its own eligibility analysis. Um, and then within the larger reserve, there are buildings that contribute and don't contribute, et cetera. Um, and so within the larger historic reserve, that's a singular FOE or finding of effect document. And all of the buildings within the larger district are notated within that finding of effect. And then their effects are notated as well. Uh, but the, the, the post hospital will not be demolished to be just for a shortcut to, to that answer. Thank you. Yeah, a yeah. short answer. That's nice to know because there's been rumors that I have not wanted to listen to. So thank you for confirming. Um, <laughs> yeah, and if there are other any other buildings in the immediate corridor, I mean, the two that we are the three um, demolitions that we have noted are the first was, is the bridge substation. That's just the immediate, mm -hmm. immediate northeast quadrant of the existing bridge and then the two bridges themselves. Otherwise, we don't have right. any planned demolition of historic resources on Washington's. Um, on okay. The Washington okay, excellent. Great. Yeah, and and I think that maybe that's what I read at the time, and yet I was still like, but they're not mentioned at all, so I didn't know if that meant something else. So, okay, Art, did we get a copy of this document, the January document? So I think us on the mailing list for their monthly meetings got a link to that larger PowerPoint, and so Haley, is is that um, one of the links on? that back page here that we could point the rest of the commissioners to that has the pictures of the individual properties? No, so Bart, that was a separate presentation that we distributed to you um, in January. And then the links to like specific documents um, would have come with like our official kind of letter distributions. And then in those official letters then we put the links to download specific documents. So. Well, what we'll do, Bart, is after our follow-up, in addition to kind of pulling, culling the DOEs and FOEs that are specific to the Clark County, um, per the first resource and follow-up, 
What we'll also do is kind of give a refresh on where to find some information, uh, because like I said, it's not on a publicly available on our website yet. You do have to have a special login to our portal and a special password just for consulting parties for Section 106 to access that. Um, and then what we've done is generated some content that is like summary information. And that's what we sent in January was a summary document that went through the eligibility and effects because we didn't have enough time to walk through them last month um, in person. And we wanted to move forward in conversation with mitigation this time. So we sort of had an interim information um, sharing in January. And then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll follow up with some additional um, information that might be helpful to commissioners to share again and provide access to some of that information. And, and so that email from January that had those more detailed summary slides, uh, I apologize if, if that was intended to go to the larger group and I didn't send that and that's causing some of this confusion. Um, I, I apologize and, and I know where that is. So would you like me to forward that to our members again? Yes, I think that would be great um, from our end if, that, if that's possible. Okay. But it sounds okay. like, the, it, this is Jan, it sounds like the information that we need to really drill down on those individual properties, aside from the six additional ones that Morgan has requested more information on, it, we don't have that information yet. So giving you feedback on, for example, the impact you're proposing on the post hospital, when we haven't seen what you're proposing, so that information is still coming. And I guess the question is, how long do we have to review that and provide feedback? So that information was originally distributed in October of last year. Um, and then we solicited feedback from all consulting parties uh, and then have made updates to those documents. And that is what we are distributing. So this information is definitely not new. It is just uh, the, the new information that's being released is just revised. So this is, again, a part of our correspondence that we sent informal um, distributions and letters to to BART and then I believe to kind of the general um, email inbox for Clark County. So I apologize that um, it didn't maybe make it to the commissioners until we started coming and presenting, but this information was shared previously with consulting parties. Absolutely. Thanks how, for the how clarification, long is the Haley. Period? How long is the comment period? Uh, all of our documents for Section 106 review have a 30-day review period. And where are we in that 30-day review period? It's either starting today or tomorrow. I've been out sick all week, so I'm actually okay. not 100% sure, but I will make sure that the team follows up and, and provides that opportunity to give you guys a deadline for that for, okay. that, for you. That, that would be good because if we don't, if the review period closes before our next meeting, that would be good to know. We can yeah, I think that we're going to have to get our subcommittee together. <laughs> Ooh, we have one. We just have to meet. Um, I have a question. It might have already been covered in all this, but I would like some clarification. So when, as it was discussed, this process is covering what will happen or and what could happen down the road, in relation to mitigation, say down the road in this process, someone who has a building in our overlay comes to us and needs to make changes due to factors relating to this and we need to come to mitigation. How are there forms? Is there a process for us to best advocate for owners in our jurisdiction once start problems start coming up and they need mitigation? Well, so let's see. So if what we're looking at for mitigation is for impacts based on that's just that's our that. undertaking, right? So that's all that mm -hmm. we are responsible for for mitigation. And so if a cons if a if a property is being impacted, then that particular uh, property owner is also a consulting party, and then they are. Um, you know, met with one on one to ensure that their input for mitigation for their respective property is 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 clearly expressed to the team so that we can consider that. And of course, we're only um, at this point with the effects that we've analyzed, um, as was represented in that table, that's the mitigation that we can codify at this point. And then beyond that, within the programmatic agreement, what it would lay out as a process for how mitigation will be addressed 
for effects that are assessed in a future state. Um, and then that process is what will carry through the rest of the environmental process now. Um, so until we have a better understanding, like for example, we're at you know 5% design. So as we take on a, a component of the larger program, which is five miles long, um, then we'll drill into the design further there and then have a better understanding of the resources, the design impacts, et cetera. And then that programmatic agreement will clearly lay out what the process is for identification, um, for that phase identification, assessment of effects, and then what the mitigation discussion, how that will move through that process. Okay, so circling back on that, as um, Commissioner Frazier has come prepared with the, there were six. Um, I could just tell him. This yeah. <laughs> so if the six organized uh, locations that Commissioner Frazier brought in do not appear on the more detailed documents you're going to be sending to us, is there a way for us to add those locations in at this point, or is your APE finalized? Our APE, uh, well, we just sent out uh, an amendment actually to the APE to all the consulting parties. And so um, that was, I believe, last month, uh, and BART should have a copy of that distribution. Um, but uh, what we should probably do is check the step prior to the determinations of eligibility, and that's the baseline. And so that was the collation of all of the resources. And so that will afford us the opportunity to understand what the eligibility of the resource is, um, and then what the effects are. Because the, the resources are coming up on this table because A, they are eligible for listing in the National Register, and B, because they have an adverse effect. So all of the resources built after 1982 have gone through that filter, and then those are the resources that are left that meet all of those criteria. So um, I think the baseline would be the best location for us to check on resources that you have questions about that may not be in the table. Uh, because it's possible that they were counted out at the baseline level because they're not eligible. And so that, again, just to be clear, was a process that was conducted uh, in early 2023 and was also shared with all of the consulting parties for feedback. Thank you for that. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of different things. I'm trying to help, I'm trying to summarize just some of the takeaways in terms of what we're get to receive. So it sounds like you will be able to put put, put together, go back to your um, documentation, all the research you've already done, and extract those sites that Morgan just mentioned um, that are in our that are in under our purview that didn't make that chart. So then we can. Um, provide comment and also then have more of a dialogue with you about the impacts and any kind of mitigation that we may need to be involved in. Yep. And then the other part is the piece that sounds like we, we haven't seen yet, but that Bart has, I believe, or are you to send it to him? All information has been shared. Have. If he has, we can resend information. Okay. So we'll get that and that, that covers more of the details of some of the things that we haven't been completely clear on in this meeting, and that should help us to understand more in depth what we're looking for. And Julie, yeah, then you agree I, with I, would, I would suggest that the subcommittee meet okay. at this subcommittee, the um, IBR, which consists of Bart and myself and any other volunteers uh, who want to join in for this fun in the next month. <laughs> Yes, can okay, I, well, let's, ask, let's make that formal at the end. Yes, go ahead. Can I ask one more question? Jen? So, mm -hmm. so has the decision been made on light rail on the bridge? Because the, I was here for the last go around on this. And, you know, <laughs> depending on where the light rail line runs and how far north it runs, it, it's going to impact different buildings. So the last I, I hadn't heard that the decision had been made light rail versus BRT. Um, so I so I'm just I am not the best um, person from our program to speak to engineering design. I just manage the cultural resources team. But what okay. I can say is that uh, there is a transit alignment included in the NEPA analysis. So okay. 
contained in our draft supplemental environmental impact statement includes a transit alignment. Um, and that is, it does terminate at Library Square at the library just south of Evergreen. Um, okay. And it follows the interstate alignment across the bridge. And as it comes into Washington, we've hugged them into the same exact corridor. Um, so the adverse effect actually to Normandy apartment is because of the transit alignment. So, that so is it's going to be that Jan. Um, when I was speaking with Mayor and this last go around, if you looked, there were three different um, proposals, all of them included light rail. So there was no option to not include light rail on this last go around. Um, and that was specifically because of like the build back better bill. It got us like an extra 1.5 billion dollars um, from the federal government. So from everything I've heard from Mayor Ann and the other people, there was light rails on there, there was no option to not have light rail on there. So that should have been in, in their calculations to begin with, but it would just terminate. They're gonna build the new transit center just south of the library. And then if anything goes further, it's up to Vancouver, Clark County, Washington to decide where light rail will extend after that. Okay, good to know, I must've missed that. Okay, so I think we, we have some work on our end. We look forward to receiving those items from you. And if it, we only have a 30 day period for comment and that includes our mitigation input is, is specifically. Uh, no, so it, so what we are just to further clarify. So what we are about to distribute are the same documents that we distributed last October but with revisions based on the consulting party feedback that we did receive. And mm -hmm. then these are the final ones that are being submitted. Many of the initial documents that we submitted back in October have already been concurred with at the state level by the Oregon SHPO and then Washington DAP. And so these will wrap up kind of the final um, documents that we need to submit and that uh, distribution will go out to consulting parties. We'll, we'll get you that login tomorrow. Um, so that's a fresh- Okay, pause, pause. Sorry, hold yep. on. So in that case, for those, um, we really can't provide comments. That's the final documents, and you just it's more for our information. You are very welcome to provide comment. Um, we have, you know, we've already reached a concurrence point with the state level, uh, at the state level. So it's unlikely that, you know, it would make a demonstrable change. But I think if there's something that we really need to consider, then there's absolutely room for, for consideration of input. There, we, 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 we do want to hear your input. It would not be a waste of your time to provide it if you had concerns. Okay, okay thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. So go ahead with the okay. next part you were going to say. Well, yeah, absolutely. So that that distribution will come tomorrow, uh, and that does have 30 days to provide that comment. But again, if you if you all let me know that you need an extra week because you need to meet as a committee and submit formal comment, like we can work together and and sort something out. That's no problem. We'll make sure that you have the opportunity to comment. So don't stress too much about the exact 30 days. We'll get you there. <laughs> Um, you. <laughs> absolutely. And then for mitigation, that does not have a specific um, you know, deadline right now. We're trying to get in front of it as much as we can. So we recognize that we're kind of fitting this in really quick after talking about effects. Um, and it's because we just want to make sure that we have the most time possible to talk about it before we have to execute the programmatic agreement, which is scheduled for the end of this year. Um, so that's going to come and go really quick. <laughs> and so we want to just be conversating as, as early as we can about mitigation. And so um, basically, as soon as we could procedurally, we started. Um, so what that will look like is kind of in late spring, we are going to share our first draft of our programmatic agreement for you all to take a look at and review. That is a meaty document, just as an early heads up. It is thick. And um, last year, it might be helpful as like by way of catch up, we did share a um, a draft outline, an annotated outline, if you will, we called it a concept draft. Um, and that kind of had uh, the nuts and bolts of what the agreement would include. And then this next version is uh, like our first legal language formal draft that is like, okay, we kind of got all the big pieces. Now, how does this feel? So um, this is where we're starting to put mitigation measures into conversation and starting to put them in writing. Um, but we realistically have, you know, the, the bulk of this year to negotiate that document and the larger mitigation conversation, just again, for the effects that we already know about 
future phased identification effects would be part of the process down the line that would be included in the document to assure everybody that that process will be met as we proceed. Okay. And so the one we're going to see tomorrow will be the one that will really help us understand what actions are being taken so we know what types of mitigation to propose. Okay. Precisely. Yep. Great. All right. Thank you. And um, yeah, thank you very much. I think this was yeah. really eye opening for many of us and we appreciate the time you took to oh. meet with us. We still look forward to those uh, <laughs> that document you promised. Don't want to forget that. Um, but yeah, we will we'll get together and um, be on top of this particular piece. So, thank yeah, you. and if you have any questions that come up across the next few weeks, don't hesitate to get them our way and we're happy to help with whatever we can to follow up. If you have, like I said, any questions or any other information that would be helpful, don't hesitate to let us know and we're really happy to get you what you need. Okay, thank you. Any awesome. other comments from the commission before we move to our next subject? Okay, thanks so much, Haley. Thank you. Have a great evening. Um, you too. Okay, we will now move to the next item on our agenda, which is discussing the proposed changes to the APC HPC rules and procedures, introductions and bylaws section. Bart will facilitate this discussion. So I'm just pulling up uh, the uh, document that we used last time when we talked about a work plan just to refresh our uh, memory about uh, why we're doing what we're doing when we're doing um, and we spoke about uh, giving giving the members an extra month to look at things uh, in this first section um, uh, that, that we had done the done the drafting on last year so that is what would be task two here um, that we started talking about in, in December and then into uh, last month, gave ourselves some extra time. Um, haven't gotten too many more substantive comments since the last time we talked, but I have gotten more and uh, Morgan got us some, some items that I would wanna flesh out a little bit later um, but I think unless anyone has uh, specific big picture questions first, uh, I, I think probably the best use of our time since we've had a lot of discussion about why we're doing this and what this is already, probably the best use of our time would just be to pull up um, the annotated document that um, Julie had spent more time on and, and her comments then could guide the initial part of the conversation. And then there's a couple other specific comments that um, Jan brought up uh, a while back. Uh, John mentioned a couple things with his notes and then that will probably spur some other comments. I will take notes, we will have the recording and then the idea would be based on what we talk about over the next few minutes, it will turn into kind of a final draft that we will all be happy with. We can take one more look next month as we move into the next section that we're gonna work on. Um, would anybody like to approach it a different way? I think that sounds very logical. And did the, the document that we have in front of us though, doesn't have everyone's comments incorporated? I thought that was the intent of getting it. The, there, the comments that were submitted were not in a format that would have okay. could so be you have them in front of yourself so you can talk, stop us and tell us where those comments come I, I can pretty much do it from memory. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, how because about we go Bart ahead is get living the Well, Bible. no, I, I'm not. I'm just, <laughs> is the Bible. I, I don't want to put anybody on the spot or anything, but you, you provided very detailed, insightful comments, and I know everybody else read it, um, but, you know, Jan, please correct me if I'm wrong. Your comments basically amounted to, it, it looks pretty good. Can we make the links active? Am I misquoting you? Yeah, it looks pretty good. It's very different than what we had before. 
And so I feel like what we had before, everything was in one document. And now you have to just keep jumping back and forth to other documents to, to really understand it. So, it, I mean, it's just a different way of looking at things. I, I, I appreciate the attempt to make it smaller and more compact and only include things there that you don't have to go somewhere else to look up, but it, I found it confusing. Um, but it's just, you know, it's the way my brain works and how I go through the layout. So, um, for, for what it is, I think it's fine. I mean, I, the way it's written and everything, it's fine. I just, the concern I had is in order to really go through and understand it, you have to keep following links to other documents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And and what I will say to that is that it would not be hard to put either sections or whole documents within this front end of our rules and procedures. But as everyone knows, when you are tying your yourself to other documents that are controlling, like the, the city and the county code, which is takes precedence over this this um, procedures document, then any time a change is made in those, if you've quoted it in your document or pulled it out verbatim, then it becomes out of date. And so for me as a staff person who deals with code all the time, I like citations. But if this group prefers verbatim quotes and larger chunks of text versus citations to code, that's easy to do. It just makes it longer and a little more housekeeping to keep track of down the road. Okay. So Bart, how about we just simply go through the comments and yeah. then if we're able to, if, you're, if there's any discussion, we'll have a discussion. If people yeah. are like, sounds good, then you'll know that comment wants to be, or should be incorporated. And then we'll just kind of go through them and we'll address that question as I, we go. That's great. And, and again, I've said this before, I'll say it as many times as I need to. This, this is just a, a stab that Susan and I took, mostly me. I'm not going to blame Susan for this <laughs> document. But, you know, two, oh, two years ago when I was getting my feet wet with this stuff and, and Jackie said, can you please pick up this project again? And so I did the best that I could with some back and forth with Jackie and some other folks on our, our staff. And, and then it had to sit for a while. And then we're, we're back to it. Nothing is sacred. No feelings are going to get hurt. We're not, we're, <laughs> this is a full back and forth. Okay. Yeah. So I've pulled up just that, that front end there. Um, I can see your comment there. Um, yeah, I don't know if, uh, so here's a question for people in the room. We, before the meeting began, we did try to dim some of the lights so we could see it better up here. But if you would prefer not to do that and just use the copy in front of you and on our screen, we can do that. I don't have the comment part. It is, it's in, in the back. In, the thick one. Yeah, it's buried. Oh. Yeah, you, it's on. Yeah, but I can I can look here. I'm fine looking here. So okay. I can make it bigger so I can actually okay. read it. Okay, so to address that, that first comment there, Julie, um, there is a reference guide page and a half on the, the uh, current older document. Um, it, when I looked it over, it had a lot of just kind of fluff language, it seemed like, and then a few um, definitions that seemed redundant with the, the code. But if, if you feel like it would make this document flow better to have a kind of front end uh, or even a, a glossary or something like that that, w that would flow through the document, that's something we could do. So I was just unclear. I just didn't know. And so that's why I put it in here because it's like if it wasn't included, we assumed it wasn't part of this, but it was a part of the, orig the, the current one. And I didn't know if it was not necessary or relevant. I actually don't remember the content. It, it's, it's been so long since I wrote these notes. It, it has so. the, the intro. I'm looking at it right now, and I can pull it up if people want, but there's just not much to it. It's mostly a preamble of stating the same aspirational language of what what the group is and, and, and why it exists. And then it has some um, uh, comments about maintaining 
information and documents that aren't even current. They aren't they aren't procedures that that staff has been doing or, or can do. So um, we could we could rewrite that page if, if you'd like to put that back in. Um, I don't know about that. I say it. I think it's up to the commission. So maybe we don't bother and then if people want to independently look at that reference guide and then come back if they feel strongly about keeping it. I mean it has One proposal. about uh, us keeping our forms updated and, and kind of just real housekeeping. housekeeping things that it seemed an odd place to have that kind of okay. guidance for staff. I'm not trying to get out of doing anything. It just seemed like kind of not real useful language. Okay, great. So we can scratch that. And then I believe that the next one, two, the next two comments are about linking. So going back to Jan's point, it's very difficult to know what we are, you know, it's, it's very important information. So I agree with you, it's best to, to go to the source so you're not updating multiple documents, you don't know which document has been updated with the most relevant. But we need it linked as a minimum, I think, um, because otherwise we, because it has, it actually tells us what we need to know in that code. And if it's not gonna be here, we need to be able to get to it easily and quickly. Yeah, and, and so I'm gonna say my opinion and um, Susan and Jason can jump in if they have a different opinion. Um, first off, putting hot links into this as a digital document, that, that's easy, that's not a problem. Our links are in the, the code that, they're only not in this because this was just a draft Word document. So, so that part's um, easy. And again, back to what we were just talking about, um, it's really just a, a um, stylistic choice whether you insert actual code citations into a document versus citing it. And, and I will defer to this group whether it's confusing to do it that way um, versus I'm, I'm just so used to having multiple documents up when I'm researching things and, and answering code questions that it didn't seem like a problem to me, but I, I realize that that's a little presumptuous, I guess. Okay, so I guess question to the group. I'm open. Okay with having links. I'm good with having links, so Academically, like when you're reading a research paper, it's very common to pull up multiple tabs. However, I think we're trying to make this most user-friendly to uh, newer commissioners, individuals of the public who are looking to become commissioners, things like that. And in modern day online searches, you're like, oh, what is XYZ? And you just click on it and it pops up your other link to that information. Um, Wiki, for an example. So I think for the next generations coming up in our tracks, having them linked is a very thoughtful consideration. One, one thing that just came to mind as uh, Elaine was talking is um, rather than sticking all the text of the county historic code and the city historic code into the front end of this document, they could be referenced as um, appendixes or something to yeah. this document. Um, so you could still have a binder with it all in one place yeah. um, as a guide, but not have it all in this front end. I don't know. I, I don't know if we need to do that though. I think if a link accomplishes what we're intending to do, a link is just fine because like you said, we want to avoid inaccurate information and by linking it to the source, when that source is updated, so will this document automatically. But if we put it in as an appendix, then that appendix is going to be, need to be updated. So I think keep it simple, add a link, and then it'll take us to the source. And, and if there was, I envision this document being used um, either at someone's desk when they're trying to answer a question, whether it's a commissioner or, or us, hardly ever would the public be needing this document very often, but maybe sometimes. Or in real time, if we had to answer a question during a meeting when we were doing a procedural question, and in which case we would have all of that in front of us to jump around anyway. And yeah. I think we're, aren't we past doing binders? <laughs> I mean, 
I know that we usually give new commissioners a binder, but I'm not, it seems like we're all on the electronic age and websites are make way more sense than handing a hard copy binder. Yeah, <clears throat> I will say um, definitely like all my students, like it's all links, that's what we use. Um, but we want to make sure that it opens up in a new tab and not just forwards it because then now you can cross check it um, because otherwise I do it all the time where it's like, oh, well, then I don't hit the back button. I close out the thing I was reading, but then I have to like yeah. control shift T and open yeah. tabs. And yep. so we want it to open up in a new tab. Um, you know, I'm not opposed to the appendix because I, I don't know. I'm a, I don't mind like I have that binder. I, I look through it like I, I still have an atlas, though, too, in my car that I keep just in case. Um, you know, so there's sometimes where people might be doing something in the back end, but you're right. It does need to be updated more and more than, um, as like some of those other rules change versus, um, you know, just having the digital link is I think Andy though. The link, the links are not a problem. I will say that the, the interlocal agreement, which is important and referenced several times here and there's one for specifically for the city of Vancouver and then for the other jurisdictions which which we have uh, you know we do the work for the other jurisdictions for historic uh, th those are those are not you know live beautiful digital documents those are scanned PDFs recorded kind of ordinance style documents and so the Maybe link we need a definition come again Maybe we need a definition of what the interlocal agreements are. Uh, we could describe it in more detail. I mean, you know, just like a little bit, you know. Yeah, not... yeah, we could do that. I mean, they are a specific document, the same as the code is. It, it's a it's a recorded, signed agreement, and they live, you know, on on several places that could have access to. Um, so here's a suggestion. Um, just looking at it again. So it says, um, you know, there's the preservation code, which would be linked and any amendments thereafter, as well as relevant sections of the Vancouver Municipal Code. And that's where I'm like, well, which sections are relevant? You could list them and have those linked and then the interlocal agreements, because you attach yeah. those to our emails. And again, have th those as appendices, because that those won't be changing. And again, this is the intro too. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we when we scroll down into the document more, the specific code sections, I have the recording numbers of the agreement. So all of these have a have breadcrumbs to be found. You don't know that when you're first reading it. You know, it's like, oh, what are those? And you don't know that that's yeah. it. That, that that that's not it. That there's more yeah, to I, it. I, what I'm what I'm hearing is let's let's um, beef up the intro, pull a little more. Um, Lang explanatory language into it to pull people into the document in a more friendly way. I don't know. Okay, I was gonna say I don't. I just remember links. That's what I yeah, yeah. On my no, the, mind. Links. the links are the links are no problem. The links are good, and that was never never an issue. So, okay. yeah. Um, and then it opens in a new tab. Opens in a new tab. I got it right there. <laughs> Very important from the, the star beside that note. I have it. Um, uh, you know, moving on to... Wait, no, sorry, there's oh, one we yeah. didn't get to. So um, there was one part that says, you know, the commission may amend these rules and procedures. And my question was, do we want to say how often we want to review and update? Do you want to say every quarter? I mean, not quarter, sorry, every two years, every ter every three years, since terms are three years. Like, do we want to be more specific? Or where where want, are you uh, at, Julie? Back under that intro, and it's um, that second... Second sentence, the commission may amend these rules and procedures as provided herein. The second paragraph, second sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no, uh, it, it, it's. My question is, do we want to say how often we want to do that? Do we want to add that in here? It's not, it wasn't in the existing rules. It's not anywhere else. It's more open open to whenever the, the prerogative right. of the commission would be to, to amend it. But I'm saying, do we want to change yeah, that I, to add, be something more specific? I wouldn't do that. No. No. Okay. I mean, I sit on a board and we wrote the bylaws and there they sit. And we look at them every once in a while and we want to make changes and add more members or do little things. Okay. So but we don't, we, don't, we don't regularly look at them. Okay. All right. We can go to the next. Yep. Yep. Um, so, 
Again, link, no problem. Anywhere you mention link. <laughs> link. Yeah, I was just going to say, can we just no. say okay to the link? No, no, that, that, <laughs> link, that's link, good. Link. And, and, and the bulk of your comments are on this page and the next page, and they are mostly on this page, and they cover the whole document. So it's not like... Right. Um, okay, so I can speak to this first one. So um, I think, okay. So I'm under B, under purpose. It says um, the purpose, et cetera, of the CCHPC is to identify and actively encourage the conservation. And my question is, did we meet, would it be better to change that to preservation? And then I had some thoughts, I had a couple of bullets and the differences between cons conservation and preservation. And so if you had an opportunity to read this a couple weeks ago when it was sent, um, those are differences between the two references um, or those two words. I guess I can just say preservation is the protection of historical and cultural sites from human impact. Conservation is the protection and maintenance of historical and cultural sites by regulating human activity, but not eliminating them from the site. Preservation is much broader, so it um, considers the history of neighborhoods, cultural context, it's not just about the buildings, but also the stories that are being told. So they're complementary for sure, but I just wasn't sure, since we are a preservation commission, does it make sense to keep it as conservation or should we have it? I don't know if it's worth changing at all, but that was something I wanted to just ask. I personally like conservation because the maintenance of these buildings and the upkeep of them is important to their protection. And that is a portion left out from preservation. Okay, it does say at the very first is the protection of historical and cultural sites from human impact and human misuse. But I hear you. If it's not big enough change or it doesn't really add much, then I, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any others? Um, the The only thing I could add to that before we move on is um, it, you could make it perfectly match the, the county and city code, which uses slightly different language. This language is in there because it just was as close as we could get to what was in the existing bylaws. And those are, those are good points. So the, those, so the purpose in the county uh, overlay is a little bit different. It says the purpose of this section so speaking of the county mm -hmm. historic preservation overlay, the purpose of this section is to provide for the identification, evaluation, and protection of historic and prehistoric resources within the county and to encourage the preservation, restoration, and rehabilitation of eligible historic and or cultural resources within the county for future generations. So conservation is not used in the county code. That's, a, that's from the existing bylaws language, mm -hmm. just for what it's worth. I think this is up to the commission. Um, what nobody's really commenting except for Elaine. Thank you. <laughs> no, well, I mean, I'm thinking about it, but um, I'm not. Uh, I know what we're. I think the reason they didn't use preservation is because then the sentence reads: "The purpose of the Clark County Historic Preservation Commission, the commission, is to identify and actively encourage the preservation of the." County's historic and cultural resources. So then you're using preservation twice, one as a, one as a title, and then one as like an, a verb. And I, that's probably where that word came from. Because I wouldn't use preservation, preservation. That would just kick it out for me, to my editing. Is there a way that we could change the sentence to more closely match the county, the county one? Because it does discuss not just the preservation or the conservation of the one item, but the different time frames, the different um, tools, and it also discusses that it's they're preserving it and maintaining it. So it does say. Oh yes, maintaining. There, there was another M word mm. in the. All I can remember is it was an M word. <laughs> what happens to get older? You can't remember. I, I'm so old. So. Um, yeah. Bart, is the city and the county code really a lot different? No, they're identical in most respects. In most respects. I'd have to look at the city.
to the you know, I just would want to be respectful. Preamble. If we if we lean one way, we want to make sure that we are, we're, we're we're being all inclusive. Why, why don't we put a, a virtual post-it on this particular thing, and we can get all the source documents mm -hmm. side by side? It would take me too much time right now oh, to yeah. do a well, real why time. Why don't we just, as I'm the one who's having the debate about it? Um, no, no, we're, this is for discussion because yeah. conservation no, is nothing wrong with conservation. No, there isn't anything and wrong with it. It sounds good. I just was, I was just asking because I was looking through the document, trying to be thoughtful. They, they do have different, <laughs> yeah, they have different meanings in, in the. In they do, yeah. yeah. So I think what you suggested is great. Maybe we should put a post it note on it, yep. see what other things say. Yep, okay. And then we can make another word together. Uh, just look at it before the meeting. All right. <laughs> Um, okay, so then the next two are links, and then the, the next comment, which is comment 10, if you're looking at the number. Mm -hmm. um, pardon me while I look original find document, it. Uh, there was a section in the original document specific to the CCHPC staff, which is still important, but it's missing from this document, and I was wondering why it's missing, and should it be added back in? Um, and and I, when I was looking through your notes, I. I the the best answer that I have for why the change was made because a lot of this drafting was done over a year ago was um, just that if changes like that were made when I was working on it or we were drafting it it was because it seemed like it was covered by the county code already and and or it didn't seem necessary to make that particular statement. See, so this is what I was talking yeah. about, where you need to keep flipping back and forth because the staffing is covered in both the city and the county code. So it's, right. you know, if that's the way we're going to go with links, then it's kind of redundant to put it in this, spell it out in this document. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, and it's yeah. not mentioned. So the reason uh, it even is identified here is because I was looking back at the old one. So if I were a new person reading this, I wouldn't even know that the staff was ever mentioned anywhere unless I went to the codes and I wouldn't know to go to the code. You know what I mean? So it's just sort Well, of we've already gone to the codes on the, in the introduction. There are already two tabs open. You're not going to, I mean. We got two tabs open. How do you think we reviewed these? <laughs> no, because it's a section about staff, staff responsibilities, staff's roles, things like that. So as you're reading an introduction, we're not, we're not talking about that specific subject. So anyway, this is under purpose. Any any other thoughts about adding a staff section back in? And if it's covered in the code, that's fine. If you're saying that it's covered in the code that's referenced here, then again, that's okay. Um, but I just doesn't, it's not explicit. I mean, we're just referencing code, yep. which is tedious as a reader, unless you're actually going to pull it up and read it. Like that's what Jan's saying, which is, you know, when we extract it, that means we're going to be flipping through different things instead of just reading one fluid document. Right, which we could make a fluid document and without re referencing the code, but then that would just, if the code should change in a certain way, that the, someone would have to be able to go through the document. Find and cross-reference those changes and make them in the document. And, and I don't know how often the code changes. I just... I don't either. Jan? <laughs> <laughs> or Jason. Well, there's the city and county make code changes at the every, every year, but these codes don't necessarily change every year. They, you know, it depends on how what tweaks come up. So, I mean, I see Bart's point having been hip deep in municipal code is that it's much simpler to just change it in one place than to have to remember all the other places that you've got pieces of code referenced. Um, I mean, we could just put, you know, a little thing in here that says staff and then links to the code, the appropriate sections of the code. So that we don't leave them out altogether. Yeah. I mean, we don't want people to be lonely. Yeah. And they may be somewhere else in the back. I can't remember, but I didn't see anything referencing it in the back. Okay. But you guys are important. We don't want to forget. You are you. important. We, we want to be invisible background characters. Oh, there you go. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm hearing you. Let's, let's yeah. 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 another virtual post in that we'll see if we can do that in a way that doesn't make it too cumbersome. Long and, yeah, long and cumbersome. Yeah, because I do think, especially for a new person, understanding what's 
who are staff? What do they do? What, how do they, you know, as a new person, if you're not somehow indoctrinated into that uh, or not indoctrinated into it to your satisfaction, you at least have something to fall back on you can read. Sure, sure. I mean, you could just do staffing, you know, another section that says staffing for the commission will be provided as outlined in Clark County Code uh -huh. and then Vancouver Municipal Code and do the links. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Jan would have the answer. <laughs> Great with those. Okay, so next is comment 13. So I'm going to try and get through these because we. Yeah, keep going. Okay. Yep. So comment 13, trying to find it. Um, right there. It's about. The uh, perhaps add in all members of the commission must have a demonstrated interest and competence in historic preservation and profess qualities of impartiality and broad judgment. Um, so this, I think, came from. Oh, okay. So then this is actually refers back to the Clark County Code and the VMC codes. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like. It's not no longer in that code, but it is elsewhere, but not in code. So I don't I don't recall. Again, this was so long ago I wrote these notes, but no, um, it, it is in the county. Yeah, it's part of the. I said perhaps added in. So I don't know if that was because it was no longer there. Um, there was something else that was in its place, but I thought I read that today, and it did say that. They, the members had to have a demonstrated, you know. Interest. Yeah, I remember reading that too. I, I don't know why I made this comment, so I'm not sure. All right, yeah, I'm seeing you going. I remember that from my application. So, all right, moving on. Yeah, <laughs> I'll have to double check that it's, because there's a reason I put there. that in there. It, it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that was. Okay. Well, the 14 requires discussion. Um, yeah. So this will, as the terms in the both codes are currently written, it does not address how terms are reconciled if someone is fulfilling a partial term from someone who vacated. Two consecutive three-year terms does not clearly define if the three-year term can be shared between commissioners or if it is one commission or if it is one commissioner. And then how we address this will impact the code and so we do need to discuss this. Because the bylaws are unclear and we had a certain way of um, addressing this and then we changed it, it's now um, I think it's now a guessing game of how we'll deal with it. So I think we do need to consider how we want our code to read. So let me just explain this in case that was confusing. So right now, all commissioners um, are eligible for three-year terms. But if a commissioner is in a, a term and leaves early, the remaining term is can be filled by a new commissioner. In this example, let's say I um, a person leaves, they have two years left, a new commissioner comes in, they fulfill those two years. They are then eligible for another three-year term. They fulfill that three-year term. But according to our code, can that person then also do another three-year term because they didn't do two consecutive three-year terms. They did a two-year two year and then a three-year. So then can they do another three-year? In the past, no. They already fulfilled that with a two-year, but it's not in our code. So it makes things confusing when we have that question arise. So it's not in our code, but you want to put something in the bylaws? I mean, I'm saying it would, that's my note. It would require a code update and we would have oh, a change in the bylaws. Okay. Because they're so, both too ambiguous and it has caused problems. Yeah, go ahead, John. To me, that reads like if, they're, if it says three year term, then they would be eligible for another one and they could be able to serve eight years. It's just like a presidency, right? They can serve two four year terms. However, if like the president dies in office, and the vice president gets elevated, if it's, it has to be more than, two, the, that person has to serve more than a two year term in order for it to count. So like you can serve 10 years as president, even though technically you're down to two four year terms. So like, if anything, you would maybe make a, you know, like if they've fulfilled two years out of the three year term, like 67 or, you know, 62 thirds per percent, then that counts as a three year term. But otherwise, the way that reads to me is if you have to have two consecutive three year terms, a two year term is not a three year term. So then I then the other the flip side is we should put that in there. So if we are saying that um, an un, uh, partially filled term is not counting towards your six years because it does make it when you're down to making a decision on commissioners and knowing what their terms are, it does cause some confusion and 
we'd, it would be great if we could just simply make a decision based on what's re what's allowed. In I the mean, past, we've had to go to legal, legal counsel a couple of times to make a determination. But I mean, to me, like it's like if if you're, why couldn't that person serve like the the next term and be eight years? Because it's I mean, if it says two consecutive three year terms, then you're still abiding by the letter of what this is. You know, this, I think this, Julie brings up a good yeah, point. Go ahead, this Jen. needs to be, the code needs to be revised to make mm -hmm. this clear because it is not. So mm -hmm. once the county and hopefully the city m make the changes in the code, whichever way it goes, but right now it's just creating confusion and it's open for interpretation on how this goes. So it, this needs to be resolved. And then once that gets resolved in the code, then we need to we can make the changes in this. I would need hi guys, this is Jason. Sorry to interrupt. And I would add that um, all of these doc this effort needs to be reviewed by both city and county legal staff. And I think this is a great example of something that they're gonna need to look at and make sure that the wording is correct. So I think it's something that needs to get resolved this evening, but I certainly think that our legal staff can help with that. So, so I guess um, the question yeah. is what's the intent? And then what, and what we want to say to the legal staff is, is the intent that you could serve eight years or is the intent that you, you can serve no more than a total of six years? So well, from that what, standpoint, then wait, can you guys hear Elaine? She is trying to come no, in. Just, sorry. Yeah. Maybe I need to be closer to yeah. the mic. Go ahead, Elaine. Um, so with this needs to be a code change and not just a bylaw addition or subtraction, do we want to make a note to have legal counsel advise between this meeting and next meeting and then make it like a section of our thing to review this so that because if we vote to make a change on this tonight and then we hear from uh, counsel regarding the bylaws. So let me yeah, just I would hold off on thing. making the change. Because I think the intent is six years. It's clear that it wants you to serve no more than two consecutive three year terms. And it goes so far as to say that then if you want to continue, you need beyond those two consecutive three year terms, you need to be absent for at least a year before you could then reapply to potentially serve another three year term or another two year term. I'm sorry, or three year. I'm getting myself confused. <laughs> yeah, I think that was the intention. Right. It just yeah. is, is muddy enough in the code that. It could be interpretive two different ways. Right. And just, just to be clear, we're not voting on any of this yet. And it will be going, the plan is to send it to legal counsel. Yeah, That's I've, definitely on the right. docket. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Bart. Um, Jason, you, I want to be clear that you are on the record multiple times saying that absolutely our attorneys need to have, look at every part of this before anything official is done. And it's a, it's a question of order of operations, whether it's the best use of our attorney's time to be, you know, looking at this on the front end versus get the closest thing we can all agree on and then have Chris and, and Trisha spend time on it. I, I know Trisha's on the call tonight, but you know, our, our legal counsel, Chris Cook is, very, very, very busy. And so these kind of preliminary conversations, I think are really good to have. And then I'm taking notes. I have a sub, a sub note right here saying legal, legal questions. And so, yes, the whole thing is a legal, legal document that needs to be looked at broadly, but then there's these particular questions that we can flesh out. And there's also the issue of there's, the intent of when these these uh, passages in the county and city code were adopted, they they were adopted by city council and, and county county uh, commissioners or county council, not by this organization. And so it's not our place to interpret what they meant. Um, and 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 so we definitely will will circle back with with Chris and Tricia and and look back in our records for these type of questions. Does that make you feel a little better, Jason? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a question for Chris and Tricia too. It's, it, to your point, it's their time. Would they prefer to be looking at this and commenting as we go or just wait till we have a completed document to give to them and for them to mark up um, 
and maybe I, I don't know. Like again, I think that's a, a question for them. And I would also caution that if some of these changes result in code changes, um, code changes just don't happen on the fly. At least in the city, code changes uh, for something like this occur annually, typically in October. So if we were going to go live with an updated document, we'd want to make sure that that aligns with us updating the code because we can't go live with a document that's referencing incorrect code. So there's the timing piece of this as well that we have to consider. Absolutely. Yeah, so it looks like for this one, um, it does look like we have some interest in understanding what the intent was. And then if so, uh, whatever that intent was, making it clear in the code. We'll just make notes so, for, future, for future code. Um, Susan? Ooh, hold on a second. <laughs> just to make a note of that for future, um, what, feedback to the lawyers, whoever, when they do the code changes. I just wanted to I add, this is Susan. Um, hold on one second, Jen. Sorry, we're... It's okay. It's hard for us to know who's... Okay. Susan? Sorry. Uh, we did have an interpretation when we had um, new members considered uh, this year. And so um, we... I guess we don't have that in writing, but um, we did discuss this and have an interpretation of what at least the county code um, meant at that time. So the Jen, question is, what was the, yeah, the question is, what was the intention? And I, I, you know, I would be surprised if you can go back and find that in anything. So I guess at this point, you know, we know that the legal needs to review this. So I guess that what I would like to see the commission say to legal is our recommendation is that people are can serve six years. However, you need to write that to make that clear. That's up to the legal department. But the question is from out from the commission's perspective. Our, you know, we feel like the intention of this is not to allow a person to serve eight and a half years. It's to allow a person to serve six years and then take a year off if they want to come back. So noted. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Well said. Thanks, Dan. Okay. So I think we we know where we stand on that one. Um, the next one is 16. And so this one is actually going to require some conversation as well. Um, in this, um, sorry, I'm looking to see where this belongs. Um, okay. So number three, terms, and con terms of commission. Um, so new terms, right now we say terms expire on June 30th and new terms begin on July 1st. And I'm proposing that we change that to terms end May 31st and new terms begin June 1st. And the reason being, we always hit it when the very first commission meeting is canceled because of July 4th. So we generally don't begin with the new commissioners until August, sometimes even September. And then we have these elections. They do not know the members that are sitting on the commission with them, and yet they're asked to vote for commission members. So to me, it makes more sense to do that turnover with the commission that has been with each other for a period of time. And then when the new commissioners come on board, they already have new sworn in um, chair and vice chair. That was my proposal. So it's just moving it up a month. So wanted to discuss that. I think it's a great idea. I, I really don't like, uh, I don't like that that's what happened to me. I came on, I had my first meeting and then I was supposed to vote for people I didn't know to be president or vice president. And nobody asked me if I wanted to be president or vice president. As a new person. As a new person. So then I felt like, what the heck is going on here? So um, I do like the idea of changing the terms and and or changing the election. One or the other so that yeah. they align in they a way. Align a mm -hmm. I think um, I'm going to move closer to my mic. I think changing the election date makes perfect sense. That way we have the new president's uh, chair and vice chair in place by the time the uh, new members join. Okay, so not changing when they expire, but changing when we vote on the people. That's, and that's what was my comment. 
this is Morgan, that was my comment. They're one and the same. So the, the, the um, term will expire and then you would vote on new members. So like this says terms expire on May, on June 30th and new terms begin June 1st. So you have to have that election in there with that. They go hand in hand. So okay. if you don't agree with the, so do you agree with both? The I'm sorry to interrupt. The um, there might be a procedural confusion. The, the new commissioners are appointed either by the city council or the county council, so we don't vote. The no, we're talking about the ter the um, commissioners. So right. Um, but, uh, but what are what vote? Chair what, and the vice chair. Sort of. What vote were you talking about? Chair just, and vice chair. Just taking that that particular vote. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. All yeah. Right. <laughs> not the new commission. Not, not I, thought you were, I thought you were implying voting no, on the No, this is about terms. Change so everything. It's yeah, number yeah. three. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's number three, terms of commission members. Got, gotcha, gotcha. Well, yeah. And it, and it looks like the code, at least I don't think the code specifically gave us dates. I think this was something that was just put in our bylaws. So I think it is something we could make a decision on. I guess you'd have to verify that. I can't remember the code. Yeah, I think we need but, verification. So verify that. But otherwise, I think if it's not in the code and they leave it up to us, then we can make a logical decision on how those should fall. Mm -hmm. So we don't. I don't think we need to make a decision now. Maybe um, if we could ask, could you double check the code for us and make sure it doesn't explicitly tell us when our, when we should vote on vice chair and chair? Yeah. And then if we don't have, to, if it's not in the code, we, it's up to us the next time people can come with their ideas on when they think that timing should fall. Does that sound acceptable? I, I'm pretty sure both codes don't have a month in them, but we'll double check. We'll double check. Triple this. check again. <laughs> and that, yeah. we'll also put that on the, um, the bullet points for the legal counsel to make sure that we have the authority to okay. do that. Thank you. Okay, question 17 is the same as above. It's about the clarity in the code, about the expiration of three years, et cetera. So we'll move past that. The 19, um, okay, so let's see. It says the chair shall at the discretion of the commission. Okay, so I guess if a person misses three consecutive meetings, the chair uh, shall request that the council City Council asked for their resignation, and I'm saying we don't really do that. And <laughs> are we supposed to? I guess I said, let's see, I don't think we do that. If we are supposed to, then I guess we need to know how to do that if that's an important piece. If that's well, it would be an important piece if you had somebody who just wasn't yeah. here. So I guess Since I've been here, everyone who's been on the board has been a very participant mm -hmm. board member. Not yeah. a, but I, I know what we they're getting at. And, ex, and it, this is on the code, right? So I'm just saying, how do we get in touch? Like, how does that process work if that's something that we want to be clear on? Um, it doesn't need to be here, or is it just something we would discuss with you if we're like, you know, this commissioner is never here. We haven't seen him for six months, and they don't plan on coming to the next meeting. Maybe we need to consider this. And then if that were the case, would we just come to you for advice, or is it something we want to have in our bylaws? I have seen that actually in the past, way before this commission. <laughs> so this is I, Susan. I think it's um, in the bylaws. I think it's in the code. So Bart, Bart should probably check, but I'm pretty sure it's in the code. And Jason can weigh in here or Bart, but it doesn't happen very often, oh. but occasionally there is someone that you, mm -hmm. that you have to ask to step away or tell them that they're yeah, you know, and they're being removed. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I would just say it says without prior notification. So, like, you know, if you're gonna miss because your spouse has cancer and you have to, like, odds are you're communicating with the the rest of the commission, right? It's not like, hey, I have some family issues and I can't make these these things. But we were talking about someone ghosting completely, and I think that's a completely different situation. Um, cause like I couldn't make it there tonight, but I'm also there on my computer. Right. So like things are, are changed more fluid now. So like I, to me, I'm, I'm fine with this. Like now how, how you get a hold of that person. Like if they're really not get like getting back to people, you send a certified letter by mail or something, there's gotta be something, but I don't know that that necessarily needs to be changed in the bylaws. Okay. Yeah. And now that we've discussed it, I, I agree personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then, um, 
I guess just clarification. It's hard to see where these notes are going. Um, oh, okay, that's a similar question, like per process. So, and then I think this should be appointment, not office. Just, I guess that's just a comment about the vacancy of an office caused by the resignation. Aren't we appoint? Aren't, aren't these appointments? So I thought that should change. I don't know for sure, but just a sounds good. Just I like comment. The it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking ahead to see how much more we have. I think we only have three more comments, so let's just go ahead and knock them out. Oh, I, I, I mean, oh, and we have because we're looking at that one right there. Because of the day and age that we live in, we should definitely change it to a member of the commission during his, her, or their term. Mm. We should have all the pronouns in there. You're right. Yeah. And probably that throughout was, the document then. Yeah, yeah, that was my comment to Bart was like, and you don't really need his, her, you can just put it there because that is all encompassing. Um, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it's just, you know. Right. Um, because you might have something that's yeah. non binary. It, it's there is just. It's gender neutral. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, I, that's an easy change to put neutral gender pronouns throughout the document. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. And actually, no, the, I'm sorry, this was printed, I think, a couple of times. So what I have here, actually, I think that's the end of my comments. So I think you have yeah. some, maybe? Yeah, your, your comments, a lot of those were kind of general the front end one so I, again julia i want to express my appreciation for the time you you spent on that um so were there other comments though i think you had some others right well we have morgan morgan has some highlighted sections that she wanted to discuss um john last meeting uh handed handed me a note um <laughs> which was a which was a good a good point uh further Further, and I'll just since John was talking, and in, in, uh, it was de back in section five, um, and uh, about written testimony being submitted uh, prior 24 hours before the meeting. Um, that's a pretty standard time frame. I think that was why it was in there. Um, but I, I mean, if, if people wanted it longer, that's a something you could discuss. Be on yeah, page my, five my, of the my document. thought process is like we get like Bart's meeting notes sometimes a couple days ahead of time, and then like that other one wouldn't be included in there. And so I don't know if there was a like a time frame of when Bart's or when whomever gets us the you know what's going to be happening at the meeting. We want to make sure all that stuff is in the notes. Are you talking about uh, items from staff, John? Are you talking about stuff from the I public? believe that's, because I yeah, think probably the items from staff, yeah, or whatever the when like when you send out the email that says, "Hey, here's what we're the the rundown or um, the meeting notes." I didn't know if like the like if you're gonna resign, like that should be in there more ahead of time. Well, I don't plan to resign anytime soon, but um, the uh, I, I get what you're saying. I think we're talking about two separate things. There's there's the 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 agenda items, the official items, and trying to have that up uh, at least a week ahead of time, and that's always our aspirational date. Um, but then there's also the um, public testimony number. I, I, this is in the public testimony section of the yeah. of the document on on uh, page five. Did you want me to scroll down? What? The schedule, the uh, work plans. Oh, yeah, I can move to that. Where is that? Um, there it is. There. So, okay. So this is part of the bylaws? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember any of this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he, and, and, and he did jump ahead to public testimony. I thought the same thing, but then I read it was public testimony, and that's something yeah. kind of different. Than your than the stuff you provide. Yeah. So John, did you, I, I might have just misread that. So, do you think public testimony should be further out, or that 24 hours is reasonable? Because that's pretty standard to get it into the record, like for the planning commission and things like that. Yeah, as long as that's enough time for like people to get the work done. I just know. Um, 
sometimes you know it's my, my wife's line of work she's always waiting and waiting waiting and like sometimes it's like you know sometimes it's better to have things done a little bit earlier than waiting till last minute but if that's if 24 hours works for for the staff mm -hmm. then i'm fine with it well we, we don't guarantee that it could be in, the, in a staff report or something but we definitely take uh public comments as late as possible sometimes literally right before the meeting if we have capacity but we so got it yeah so can uh, it works it works well yeah like at a school board meeting you can do it up until 4 30 of that day for public testimony but just to clarify we're talking about just public comment periods not things that we have to review and make decisions on in that moment it's Okay, I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Right, it's uh, number five on page five. five B. Mm -hmm. That, that uh, John's discussing. Did you want to say something, Susan? Or? No. Okay. I would you like to yeah. talk about your highlights, Morgan? Uh, yeah, I I went through. I didn't see too many things. Uh, you might have it in front of you or not. But um, uh, under D, in power of a uh, powers and duties, major responsibilities of the commission. And, uh, and under that, there's three conflict of interest, and then there's A, B, C, D, and E. And then I, I wanted to talk about C, because uh, it says a recused commissioner will refrain from participating in any aspect of the commissioner's consideration of that matter, that's fine. Whether testifying or deliberating, that's fine. If possible, the commissioner will not be present during the work session or hearing of the matter. We've never enforced that. No, we haven't. And so that's just kind of a weird thing. Like for my comment was, I would rather have all the commissioners there and just have that particular commissioner recuse themselves from that particular thing, but then be there later to talk about everything else. Everything else. Mm -hmm. Because I think that I value everybody's input and I wouldn't want to just not have yeah. somebody there because you know, they're, you know, they, they uh, are on the board for the Clark County Historic Museum. Right, so yeah. I'm guessing it was put in there so that even if they weren't directly um, so it testifying, evil eyes. it wouldn't give us evil eyes, it wouldn't make faces of, oh my word, what is happening right now. There wouldn't be any subliminal voting on their parts that might sway the vote. I'm not saying we should do that, I'm just assuming that that is why that was put in here in the first place. Yeah, like to me it was, I, if you're thinking about like the old way where we were all meeting, like you would have a meeting, everyone's there, that person would step out just for that piece and then you would might maybe get them and come back in you know once that's done right. yeah. that's the way that's the way i, I, I that. and in the past when we've had someone who had a, who were recused who recused themselves they did a couple of ways one they um just said it in the meeting and then they simply were quiet on the mic and that worked fine another way is they went and sat in our section that's for the public so they were behind the commissioners and then joined us when that topic was over. They could leave the room. We've never had someone needing to do that, but that's possible. And then another way is on the phone, they actually disconnect from being a, um, a commissioner and sign in as a member of the public if they wanna make a comment, but they need to recuse themselves from, from official officiating discussion. Yes. So I, I agree though, I don't think that it should be that they shouldn't be present because there is other work that we need them to do on the commission. And that's just how I read it. And they, like we always said, the intent could be something different, you know, that they just shouldn't be present during that, that particular portion. I don't, I'm not sure what the intent was there, but I really appreciate everybody being at the meeting. So are you proposing taking it out? I don't, I don't see the value in if possible, the commissioner will not be personally present during a work session on the matter. I agree. I mean, if you want to, if we wanted to say the commissioner will be silent during that or not, or not, not non participatory. I mean, we've already said they're going to recuse themselves and will refrain from participating in any aspect. And everyone's a, such a professional. I just can't see them not being a professional. Well, how about to, to, to move this point along? Cause it's a good point is we put this on the questions for perfect. For, legal because there may just be some statutory limitation right what can be <laughs> no, there could be something can weird. be required of, of people who recuse themselves and and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves mm -hmm. yeah because we like she said though we do not do that and not only that we could then um, 
we're very we could then no longer have a quorum to meet on other matters if we required that. So I, I, I do think that could be very problematic if that was something that we enforced. Yeah, let's ask the lawyers on that one. Um, the next one right after that was officers, and this goes back to what we were just talking about. The commission will, by majority vote, elect a chair and vice chair at the regular meeting in July of each year, which is just super hard to do mm -hmm. if you have new people who aren't, I mean, in a perfect world, that would work if the new people that were coming on got all of the information but you know we know that things fall through the cracks it just you know just does happen you know um i just find that that's just such a tight mm -hmm. tight schedule mm -hmm. so i don't really know how to fix it so i think we agreed we're going to um find he's going to double check the code to make sure that there's that we have flexibility to make the change and then if we do the next meeting we will decide what the timing should be if it's a month earlier or two months earlier whatever whatever the commission decides next yep and then the last one that I can't believe it, nobody has here has mentioned. I've, F, public meetings. The commission shall begin consideration of no meeting agenda item after 10 p.m. Oh my God, <laughs> I am not gonna start considering something at 10 o'clock at night. I can't even consider something at nine o'clock at night. I mean, I can have a discussion like this, you know, but that seems awfully late to be considering. I mean, that means we would have been here four year, four hours I with like no snacks. Years. Oh, snacks. Yeah. no snacks. <laughs> So I will say there has to be a cutoff, right? And we have gone beyond nine before. There have been subjects. But not new, this is new. The commission shall begin consideration at 10. Agenda item. So it's on the agenda. It's just simply, let's say, so when we were discussing the academy and the smokestacks, those conversations with the public and the commission would go very late. They went till 9.30, but nothing started after but, 10. But let me just finish. There were items on the agenda that perhaps could have continued just like we did the other day. We, we went up to a point and then we said we still have agenda items, but we're going to end the meeting early or we're going to end the meeting and move those things to the next time. But I guess what I'm, I'm just thinking, I, I agree with you, 10 is very late. Who wants to be here at 10 o'clock? But there has to be a cutoff, right? And so there has to be nine a cutoff, but 9 o'clock could be like problematic when we already do go beyond 9 o'clock sometimes when there's a really important subject. That's yeah, I do see that. I just think that uh, four hours on a Wednesday no, with, a working, with, <laughs> with a working commission is a lot to ask. Yes, could we change, I propose, um, <laughs> that we change that 10 p.m. to 9 p.m.? Or even 8.30? I could do nine. I would do nine. I could do nine. Because there are some things that occur that you cannot anticipate how long they're going to take. And if you have a lot of public comment for certain subjects, that does eat into our time to do our work. Well, and then we'd have to just push those, the, whatever was on the agenda to the next meeting. Yeah. Or have a special um, meeting. Have a special meeting. We have done that yeah. before. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought that when it said begin consideration, after 10, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't want to begin considering anything after 10. So if that's something we can change, can we change that to nine? Unless Jan and um, everybody else online would like to like, stay until 10. Like to stay till 10. No, I'm, city council did this <laughs> two decades ago okay, when they the, just said, we don't make any decisions after, you know, midnight or 11 o'clock because no oh one my makes gosh, the decisions Jan. then. Nope, that was it for me. I'm fine with nine. And it really and, it and does just read to be that clear. Oh, go ahead, Jen. Go ahead, oh, I, I just oh, I, that it, what it's saying is no, we, you won't begin consideration. So essentially, it's a new agenda item that, that's already on the agenda, but you're not going to you're just going to table it till the next meeting if it's if the right. discussion starts after ten o'clock. So if it's a public hearing we're involved in that started at 6.30, you know, we, we'll keep going. Yep. Yep, okay. new, new item. That's, yeah, it just means it's, yeah. it's one that we haven't gotten to yet on the agenda. Like it's just, and we're just like, you know what? We're gonna call it. It's, right. It's extra innings already. And we just wanna, good. and we wanna have it in our bylaws because what, what would, what happens that I could foresee like the worst thing happening was somebody had a copy of our bylaws and said, said but you said that it's only 9.55, you know, it's not 10. I want you to consider my 
my whatever, you know. So that's what I want to not consider anything new. And I, this is not time. in the code, so this is definitely us. Okay. Yes. Yes. Are there any? Were there any other comments or any other notes for the what, what section that we reviewed? Well, John, that do you just have any the, others? I, well, now now that she had brought this up, I, I'm thinking like. What if for some reason we don't start at six o'clock and we start at seven? Like, should it just be no th meeting item should be heard three hours after the start of the meeting? Well, we don't have control if sometimes the meetings start late for things out of our control. But. Yeah. I don't think right now, I think at this point, because we do say that we have our regular meeting starting at six on the first Wednesday. I would imagine since our bylaws are flexible and we can make changes to them, if that does become the case, we could, we could adjust. My two cents. Well, and that section also says that, a, you know, a majority of the commissioners present could vote to extend the time. Mm -hmm. Right, like so we were in we, the best discussion right. ever. <laughs> and, or, if, or if we felt okay. like whoever was presenting to us or whatever the public hearing was needed to, you know, we needed to do it that night for some reason. We could vote as a commission to extend the, the meeting. Yeah. Good point, Jan. Any, any other comments before we move on to our next item for the bylaws? So it looks like um, we, for next week, we'll be prepared to talk about the bylaws um, for the historic register. I think that's the next subject. Oh, so our county heritage register. Yeah. So very quickly, then, what my intent would be based on this conversation, and I didn't know how this conversation was going to go. So thank you, thank you all for being flexible and and creative. Um, I want to summarize these comments now that I have more meat to it, and um, and then ask the questions that need to be asked by um, people with more knowledge than myself, and um, then we can have a a document that's a little um, little bit more finalized. And again, we're not voting on, on this as a final document until later down the road. So it'll all get vetted and, and everything like that. And, and then I will send out a separate email with um, the, uh, the next section to look at. And, and it, it won't have as many changes as, as this. Um, and I, I'm not going to make a draft document the, the next document will just be, let's get comments and, and then do it in just a two-step process. Um, will we review them like we did today? Yes, you'll, you'll see, it, it, the, the email will make it clear what, what um, it, it's not a section like this with a bunch of, of heavy code sections. It's, it's more just the procedure for getting things on the register. So just some basic updates and flow issues. That's what you'll see, I think. Okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you, guys. All right. So the next item is um, a, in regards to an additional historic promotion grants recommendation, and Susan will give us an update on that. Thank you. So we received a hard copy application from the Shalashi Prairie Railroad, um, also known as BYCX. And unfortunately, I misfiled that application. So it did not get routed to the subcommittee or um, it, and it was not included in the applications that were considered by the full uh, commission or the county council in fall of 2023. So I uh, learned of this issue last week and I did a few things. I contacted budget staff to make sure that we could uh, that the commission could consider it in the 2024 budget and they affirmed that uh, it could be included um, in the existing budget. Uh, I then called and spoke with Chair Baum and um, talked to her about how we might want to approach this. Um, I think you may have all seen in the email that I sent out on Friday. Um, I was very grateful to get three volunteers to serve on a subcommittee to review the application over the weekend. So thank you very much to those volunteers. Um, and uh, I received emails from each of those members uh, regarding the application. 
uh, I created a draft staff report that is included on the website and in your materials uh, that would potentially recommend if you want to, if you vote to do that tonight, um, to county council that we, that the commission would recommend uh, this additional application. And uh, I did receive one uh, question from Commissioner Zingali, and I called the applicant. Uh, the question was if, um, so the application is for to purchase paint to repaint the steam locomotive um, that has recently gone, uh, undergone um, updates and renovations. And uh, Commissioner Zingali's question was about if the paint job would be historically accurate. The applicant verified that they do plan to uh, follow the original paint job. They have a picture of the locomotive when it came off or when it was constructed and uh, they are actually going to bring that to us. Um, it um, isn't available until Monday of next week, but I will send that out to you so you can see it. Um, but they are going to follow hit, uh, the historically accurate paint job. And so um, uh, I guess staff this evening is requesting First of the members that served on the subcommittee, if you want to have any discussion um, because no meeting was held as it um, has been done in the past, it was just done via email so far. So far. Um, and then uh, following any discussion, uh, ask for a vote of the full um, commission regarding the project so that we can take this to county council as soon as possible. So John or Morgan, I will turn it over to you first if you guys want to make comment. Sure. And, and oh, thank I've, you. For, oh, go, go ahead. ahead John. Go ahead, John. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, and thank you for reaching out to them because when I was going through the application, the one picture that I saw was very like it looked much more recent. And so like I want to make sure they're saying this thing is like almost 100 years old that, you know, we're adhering to the historical preservation of everything. And and how are they going to do that? Because that material was not in the application. And so my initial reaction is great, but I also don't want to necessarily improve it until I see that picture. Um, that's my thoughts. Um, I was really excited to see this application because uh, I'm attached to this railroad and I have seen it through some of their previous grant cycles and I'm very excited to um, see it painted again. And uh, yeah, I'm sorry that we didn't see the picture. I know that they, they did um, say that they were going to, un not in the document, paint it in the historical mm -hmm. fashion the, from a picture. Um, but. It was unfortunate it didn't get looked at, but I feel like we should um, accept it. Make a recommendation. Okay, yeah. Um, as for myself, I agree. I, I was happy that we were able to um, knock it out. Thank you so much, John and Morgan, for those that last minute jump and like request and you guys just jumped right in. And um, yeah, I was really excited to see it. I've also seen it come through different grant cycles and we've helped them progressively along the way. They've done so much work on their own. And so I was really excited to see that this is one of those last steps um, for that, that pro project to be finished. Um, so I guess the question is, do we, do we have a motion to approve? Is that the next step? I'm sorry, it's not um, part of my. I, uh, so, can is I ask there, one question? So John, yes, please. But were there were there grants that didn't get funded in this last funding cycle? No, Susan? no, we only no. had two applications. This would be okay. the third. So, you know, as far as that's concerned, yeah, and there's money. Okay. So we only had two apps. They were both approved. So that's fine. I just wanted to make sure we weren't going to have people who say, wait a minute, I got my stuff in on time and I didn't get funding. <laughs> right. um, not, not that they didn't get their stuff in on time, but uh, okay. So yeah. Right. 
I just guess, you know, I know I haven't been on here long, but everything else that we've gone through and approved, we're talking, we've got lots of pictures, lots of all that other stuff. The picture that we're going to be basing this paint job off is not included yet. And so like, I'm having a hard time, like I could see voting on it next commission, but to me, I, I, with, I see the thorough thoroughness that you all go into, like talking about the brick versus the mortar and all of the, all of those details <laughs> and looking at the, the stained glass like thing, it makes it weird to me that we would vote on this without having all the materials in front of us. Is there, um, from, can we table this till they get the picture in? Hold on one second. I think Morgan was going to comment. One Sorry. second to respond. The only thing that I was going to say, John, is that um, in these applications for these grants, they don't usually provide anything, nothing, mm -hmm. a photo, maybe, but usually not. Mm -hmm. um, these are just uh, nonprofits that we have built relationships with. So for me, myself, I feel like we've had we have a relationship with this nonprofit, and we have a, 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 we're invested in the project. And they know that, and we, we, me, I, I trust them personally. Like I don't trust every single um, uh, nonprofit that comes in front of me asking for money and saying they're going to paint it to a historic, in a historic fashion. Um, but I tend to lean towards that also because from my percep perception, there's no follow up on these grants. We don't really know what happens after yep. we give them. I mean, they say they're done. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't really get to see that the end product ever. That's not really part of. We hope to change that, but yes, that is accurate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would love to see it. I'd love to see it. We <laughs> want to make it more formal that they come and show us what they've done. But I yeah. do agree with John that if they say they're going to provide documentation that it is authentic, that they're not going to paint it, I'm not discounting your relationship. I just don't have a relationship with them. And so this could be anyone from my mm -hmm. point of view. If the organization says that they are going to be providing us documentation and that they're not going to paint it purple with right. yellow pink polka dots, um, then I do not see the problem with tabling it till our next meeting. And if should they provide us the information, we can go forward and provide them the fundings 30 days after when we would have done it in this meeting. Yeah. So I will, I will say that um, I actually fully agree with Morgan um, personally. And after looking at their application, this partner knows what they're doing. They've hired professionals to do this labor intensive reconstruction of the locomotive motor or the locomotive structure. And their invested interest is so great that they're not going to do something that's disrespectful to the history of this locomotive. I think that they are going to be above and beyond what most people could could do, but that's my perspective. And their proposal was very straightforward. It was very simple. We need paint, and we hope to do this in the spring because we're at the very last stage. They um, and as Morgan said, we don't. It's not the same thing as a certificate of appropriateness where they're um, where they have to get that certificate of appropriateness to do work. This is a grant where we're giving them money to help support a historic restoration of this locomotive and now in this case the paint. Um, I would suggest, and then the other thing is, is once we vote today on whether or not to put this forward, it has to go before the council to get approved. And so if we delay a month, it's actually going to be a couple of months because it's not, it's not just once we're out of here, they get the money tomorrow. There's another approval process. So I'm a little concerned about the timing if we're going to delay it even further just for a photograph. Um, and I'm not even sure what that photograph entails. What is that photograph? And is it in color? <laughs> so I might be able to help. Um, this is Susan. Um, there is an, a photograph that was included with the application. It's shown on the screen right now. And my understanding from the applicant, what he said was that uh, uh, they had, they used the locomotive for a while and then they purchased it. When they were using it, it did have a different paint job, but they gave it a historically accurate paint job uh, when they purchased it. And now once they've done some work on it, they're going to give it a the same paint job. So 
I believe the paint job shown in this photo is that correct paint job um, that they're going to do. He, he did reference, um, and I can't read what it says, <laughs> um, but he said it was going to be black. I guess I don't know what it, how it was painted in the interim, but um, I believe it was like green. Um, but he did say it was going to be painted black, and other than the very front of this, this is all painted black. So um, I just wanted to, to add that, and I should have led with this as well. My sincere apologies that this happened. It was, you know, I just threw the materials in the wrong folder, and they didn't get processed. But um, I, you know, feel bad that that happened, and would never do that on purpose. It was obviously just a mistake. Yeah. So. So does Jan have any uh, input? Well, you, you got my input, but these these people have, have, this organization has been coming for a historical promotion grant for years. So as you've noted, we're very familiar with them. It's $1,500. I would say, let's go ahead and I, I will make a motion to approve this grant application. I will second that. Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say nay. Okay, hearing none, the motion passes. Thank uh, you all. I, were we gonna, I was just, I'm gonna abstain from the vote. I'm not gonna vote nay. I just would like to just, as an abstention. Okay. I forgot that there. was an option, so I will change my vote to abstain as well. Okay, should we do this again? So, yeah, go ahead. I see, Art. I see some concern on two faces. I didn't know I'd need to use the bylaws tonight. But anyway, um, <laughs> so 51% of the non-vacant membership of the commission constitutes a quorum, okay? And um, so we can vote with the five people that are here. Um, three, three yeses would be a majority of the members present. So, yeses. so we have three yeses. And if you want to, we can, you did a, just a voice vote to start with. So we could go through and each, Roll call. each member identify okay. their vote. All right, I'll do a roll call vote. Jan Bader? Aye. And you? Aye. Morgan Fraser? Aye. Elaine Thatcher? Are we saying we're here or what the vote was? No, you what your vote is? Voting. Oh, abstain. John Singali? Abstain. And I vote yes. Um, it sound, so three yeses, two abstain. Two abstentions, two, yeah. two non votes. And so the majority is, has a passed that we put this recommendation forward to the council that we do fund them. Um, I think there's still interest that people have their concerns addressed and that they do see the photo, uh, all of us, that we do see the photo and that um, there's that that is um, addressed. Through them. Hopefully it's a, either an email um, confirming if it's a black and white photo, because I don't know if it's a historic picture, and that, you know, if he can confirm. Just thinking of the time frame of this locomotive. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Susan. I believe it will be a black and white photo because he said it was from when it was built. Yeah. So. So he'll need to confirm, I guess, also in in writing. This is okay. We have some kind of evidence that it's a black locomotive, and we're painting it black again, as opposed to gray or navy or dark green. And bright green. Bright green. Well, bright green would show up a different color, I think, on black and white. <laughs> and just out of curiosity, when is the council meeting to discuss to um, put this forward? Uh, the next council meeting that we could make the agenda for would be, I believe, February 27th. Okay. 
um, yeah, so um, we would be getting materials to council's uh, office next week for that. Okay. Okay, we're almost through our agenda. Um, just the next topic is, are there any commission announcements or events that they would like to make note of? It's one of our agenda uh, items. Yeah, go ahead, John. This is February, right? Yeah. So I can't, let me pull up my calendar. Um, I know some of you have signed up to be judges at the regional history day um, competition. Um, that's March 9th. I think we actually will have our, yeah. So I guess March 7th, we'll still have, um, our meeting, I guess, with that Wednesday beforehand. Um, but right now we have, a, where's my thing? A hundred and uh, 50 students from out Southwest Washington that'll be participating in the, the National History Day regional um, piece. So um, it's gonna be really cool. We've got kids from, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth, uh, sixth through 12th grade um, with some uh, really cool stuff. So um, I'm, Happy to have support of some of the other uh, counselors and commissioners here to, to help judge and uh, the kids are excited. That's for sure. Great. It's exciting. Thank you. Thanks for the update. Does anybody else have any announcements or updates? Looking around the room. Okay. Um, our last item before we do a good of the order and adjournment are any subcommittee updates. I'll just go through the list and if there are none, just say none, please. Are there any from demolition? Uh, we have a meeting at the Historic Museum in March on the calendar in per, uh, in person meeting. Excellent. Um, next is design design review and website revision. I can give that really quickly. We are meeting next Tuesday, and we are continuing to make some progress. We have a lot of documents we're revising, updating. Um, so lots of work going on there. Um, does outreach have any updates or anything to, to mention? Uh, I have not uh, spoken to Commissioner Greg in a little bit, but um, now that I'm through <laughs> my big event at school, uh, I will reach out to him to make sure we're uh, touching base again on, on that and get a meeting on the book. So. Okay. Oh, and I believe he's back from Southeast Asia tomorrow, possibly. <laughs> Sleep yeah. out. Know, he's, he's, <laughs> he's probably yeah, so, um, I'm sure that, that'll happen. <laughs> Hopefully soon. No, no worries. <laughs> Thank you. And then the CLG grant project. Um, so we did come together for that and we have a meeting, standing meeting on Fridays now. Moving forward, we talked to Michelle Thompson about our um, intent for this proposal and our tiered approach and she gave us some feedback and now we are working on the research and background to draft the grant. So we'll keep you posted on that, but that's, and we, we do, or we need one. Oh, and this is exciting. We actually, um, yeah, so Morgan um, reached out to a former commissioner who is a historic preservation professional in our community and knows our community very well, and he has joined our subcommittee. So he will also be attending our meetings and giving us input, um, and that's Sean Denniston, just to think for those of you who know him. And one other question I did want to ask, we did actually need one more volunteer to be on the design review subcommittee. We lost a committee member and so we have room. If anyone is free and interested in joining us, please um, let one of us know. We'd love to have you come hang out with us on Tuesdays, <laughs> every other, every, every month. There's one Tuesday a month. So, all right, that's, um, I believe that's the end of the subcommittee updates and announcements. And now we have, are there any items for good of the order? I'll just, I'll throw one out there just for the sake of moving things on, but I will also just add it with gratitude. Um, just really appreciate John um, and Morgan, like I said earlier, but I, I just wanna say it again, for stepping in and taking the time over your weekend, reviewing this application, getting your stuff sent back. Thank you, um, Susan, also um, for, being open and communicative and helping things move and getting things done so this this applicant could be reviewed and um just really appreciate you guys and your time and for for being being there when you were needed so thank you that's my good of the order any others i'm looking around the room okay if there are no other comments then i will take a motion to adjourn i will make a motion to adjourn 
I will second that motion. Motion passes and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I can wait.